Okay, Matt, we are live and recording. So, um, where um, are we going? Brilliant, guys. Well, firstly, thank you for giving up what could be an hour and a half, two hours of your, your evening. I appreciate the, the Norwich game is on for those that are from Norfolk. Um, but yeah, just to welcome Norfolk clubs and Suffolk clubs to this webinar tonight. The kind of plan is is a little bit of a, you're going to hear a little bit from myself and Ian, but not massive amounts, just because I think you guys are here to hear from Julian, our senior regional pitch advisor from the Grounds Management Association, but I'll let him do his own introductions. Um, but just a quick one. So I'm Matt, I'm the Football Development Manager for Suffolk FA, and we've also got Ian on the call, who is the, correct me if I'm wrong, Head of Facilities and Development at Norfolk FA. Um, Ian is going to go through a bit of some housekeeping in a minute. We're going to listen to Julian for the vast majority of it, which you'll be pleased to hear. You haven't got to listen to myself and Ian because I'm sure you get enough from us as it is. Um, he'll go through bits and pieces around pitch power and also the, uh, some do's and don'ts, bit of do's and don'ts, yeah, a bit of Q&A at the end, things like that. And also we'll go through a little bit of the funding um, just towards the end of the session and there'll be time for some Q&A. Use the chat function. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll hand over to Ian to, to go through the housekeeping. Thanks, Matt. Um, just a little bit from me before we get started. Um, so myself and Matt are representatives of the, the county FAs um, from Norfolk and Suffolk on the call. What we'll do, we'll share the slide deck, we'll share the recording afterwards. So I will share to the respective Norfolk uh, delegates and Matt um, from a Suffolk point of view. Um, there's a fair bit to get through tonight and a lot of information. As Matt said, really, you don't want to hear from us. You want to hear from Julian. So we'll work as swiftly as we can through the content that we've got. I will keep an eye on the microphones throughout the evening um, just to make sure that they don't slip on to being on so we get loads of interference. If you want to ask any questions, though, which is the whole purpose of tonight, please unmute your microphones and feel free to ask away. Alternatively, there is the ability um, in terms of chat functionality as well. Um, so by all means, please feel free to use that um, as a means of asking questions. Um, just ask, there'll be lots of opinions and thoughts on tonight shared from a lot of experience that we've got uh, in terms of grounds maintenance. So please just be respectful for that. I'm sure that won't be, um, that that will be the case. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll circulate the information to you post tonight. Um, that's it from me. You'll be pleased to know the end of my dulcet tones for now. I'll hand over promptly to Julian, who will take you through some of the content. Julian, just give us a thumbs up when you want me to, to move the slides on, and I'll, I'll do that for you. Great stuff. <clears throat> Thanks, Ian. Evening, everybody. So, um, firstly, great to, to see many, uh, so many of you on this evening. Um, pleasure to be covering Norfolk and, and Suffolk now as, as part of my new region. Um, so, to introduce myself, I'm Julian Morris, the senior regional pitch advisor for the Grounds Management Association uh, covering the Central East region, which uh, incorporates nine counties. Um, I've been involved in what was previously known as the Grounds and Natural Turf Improvement Programme since March 2018, <clears throat> previously covering the East Midlands, uh, covering football and cricket, um, and, and just a little bit about me in terms of my background. So. Um, like most of you, I've been a grassroots volunteer uh, for nearly 20 years from the age of 15. Um, but in terms of my professional experience, I worked in professional football for a decade, um, five of those as a head grounds person. Um, so hopefully I've kind of got a good insight um, into, into both sides of things and can sort of give a balanced view on, on most problems. Um, do you want to move on to the next slide, Ian, please? <clears throat> so, as I said, I touched on a little bit. We used to be known as the Grounds and Natural Turf Improvement Programme. And the way that um, our programme works is that I work for the Grounds Management Association, but the programme is funded by national governing bodies. And the uh, previous phase of the program was funded by uh, the FA, the Football Foundation, and the ECB, um, and we've now moved into a new phase of the program. So that is why many of you um, will have will have known and met Phil Jego, who was my predecessor predecessor in your area, 
and he's moved into a cricket only role now. So uh, the the new program called the Pitch Advisory Service is funded by Sport England, the Football Foundation, the ECB, uh, FA, um, and it also incorporates in our rugby league and rugby union. And because of that expansion of the program, we've now moved into to single sport. Um, so as part of that, I've moved into the role of senior RPA. Um, and as I said, we've now got myself and six of the regional pitch advisors that cover the uh, the country. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Grounds Management Association, we're the leading um, <clears throat> membership organisation for grounds professionals and volunteers, looking essentially to enhance um, all areas of the sector through um, training, support, um, links to funding. Um, and we collaborate, as I said, through various different sports that we work with. Um, and some of the areas of support that we offer are visits and reports, support and guidance, advice and, and recommendations, which many of you all benefited from before. Um, can I move on to the next slide, please, Ian? There we go. So there's a, there's a bit of a map of, uh, of, the, of the country. As you can see, I've got a, a fair old chunk to cover. Um, but um, but really looking forward to hopefully getting out and, and seeing some of you um, over the course of the next few years. Next slide, please, Ian. So what support is available? So I'm conscious that the many of you that are on tonight will have been part of the grass pitch improvement journey for a number of years, but there may also be quite a few of you that are new to it. So I just sort of wanted to run through kind of some of the principal areas um, that the program and the Football Foundation funding can support you with. Um, so the Football Foundation have got a target of improving 20,000 grass pitches to the Grounds Manager Association's good standard by 2030. And what we've worked on over the last few years is what's now known as the Grass Pitch Maintenance Fund, which is a six-year tapered grant providing up to a maximum of two and a half thousand pounds uh, for an 11 or so pitch and as you can see it it staggers down based on pitch size um, it's it's 100 funded in the first two years and tapers down over years three to six um, this grant in particular is to do what we would call specialized work so um, it's to engage contractors to do tasks such as deep spiking, fertilisation, overseeding, uh, slitting, those sort of things. It can't be used to cover what we call routine maintenance, which would be line marking and mowing, um, but all of those specialist um, practices that uh, you'll get recommended in your pitch power reports, those of you that have one already, and hopefully those of you that are to complete one, um, you can use the grant towards that. Um, the amount of funding that is available does depend on the quality of the pitch. So when you have your pitch uh, assessed through pitch power, uh, you'll get a grade. And then accordingly, depending on whether it either comes out of poor or basic or uh, good or advanced, you'll uh, be potentially eligible to apply for a certain amount of funding depending on the pitch grade. So the idea is, is that those pitches that are at poor or basic we allocate the funding required to get them to the good standard and then those pitches that are already at the good or above standard we can support them with funding to make sure that they manage to maintain or improve the standard that they're already at um, hopefully your pitch power reports will allow you to kind of produce your own maintenance schedule based on the recommendations that you get um, and there's also Crucially, I don't want to steal too much of Matt's fund earnings and talk about this sort of towards the end, but there are uh, there is support available through small grants to help you with the uh, purchase of pitch maintenance equipment for those of you that maintain your own pitches or may be interested in supplementing the maintenance uh, of a contractor or even potentially a local authority. Um, and in terms of eligibility, the grants I've mentioned are for grassroots community pitches, so pitches that are step seven or below um, outside of the National League step system. 
Uh, but there is the football stadium improvement fund available to support those venues that are playing higher in the pyramid. Can I move on to the next slide, please, Ian? Yeah, so just a little bit more about the grass pitch maintenance funding considerations. So I've touched on already what it can be used for. Um, there is a requirement to, as part of this funding, to submit two pitch power assessments annually. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is it's been a little bit of a point of confusion as to when people are expected to kind of provide their submissions. So there's a mandatory submission window for everybody that signs up to the funding of the 1st of November to March 31st. So you're expected to provide one submission uh, in that period. Um, and then a further one in either 1st of April to the 30th of June or July 1st till the end of October. What I normally encourage people to do is to try and space their submissions kind of six months apart. Um, and if you can avoid closed season, that's ideal because obviously we want to be kind of capturing the condition of your pitch when it's in the playing season and when it's in use. Uh, and the reason why we have that mandatory winter window is so that we can give you appropriate support and guidance when your pitches you know we potentially expect them to be um at their worst so what we want to try and do is get pitches to the good standard in in the winter rather than in the middle of summer when when they're potentially not being used or recovering very well um if you do get access to the grant um there is the gma's online level one course um essentially that's to kind of give you the fundamental knowledge on um, pitch maintenance, so sort of covering off most of the basics. And that's really useful, A, if you're either maintaining your own pitch, but also if you're organising works with a contractor or having discussions with a local authority, it kind of gives you a little bit of knowledge to be able to kind of be equipped to, to have those discussions. Um, and as it says there, there may be site visits kind of carried out over the six year period of the grant to monitor progress. But obviously, the main monitoring will be through through pitch power. Um, and I won't <clears throat> I won't go into it in any more detail. You can, you can read the slides for yourself, but it does touch on there how the uh, tapering of the of the grant works. Next slide, please, Ian. Yeah, so to move on to sort of another area of support available. So for those of you that haven't signed up to uh, the Football Foundation's groundskeeping community, um, it is to all intents and purposes um, a Facebook for grounds people. Um, other social media platforms are available. Um, and we've got over now over 2,800 users on there, the vast majority of which are grassroots volunteers. Um, there is a forum function on there for you to uh, go on there and ask questions uh, based on any pitch uh, maintenance issues you might be having, any questions around machinery for those of you that um, might be interested in equipment and allow you to go on there and kind of ask other grassroots volunteers what equipment they've accessed, how they found it, pros and cons. Um, there's interaction with myself and the other regional pitch advisors. So we have a commitment at our end to uh, come back to any pitch maintenance related questions, um, to come back to you on those, providing they've not been answered sort of appropriately or anybody else in the community. The nice thing about it now, we've got a lot of users on there as a lot of the, uh, a lot of the interaction is kind of peer to peer rather than, um, rather than myself or one of my colleagues kind of nipping up and answering questions for you um, we've also got a host of kind of maintenance essentials on there and learning tips and resource cards so one of my um, areas in my new role of senior RPA is um, to build the learning resources on there with the rest of the RPA team so we've got I think over 55 learning resources on there that cover everything from um, mowing to fertilization scarification to vertical draining um, and there's a host of videos on there as well that talk you through everything from how to mark a pitch out from scratch um, to how to divot your pitch correctly, etc. So there's there's a wealth of information on there. It's really worthwhile 
signing up to the groundskeeping community if you haven't done so already it's completely free um, and it's literally just an email and password to uh, to sign up um you want to jump on to the next slide please Ian? yeah and just to sort of cover off a little bit about the the gma training so i mentioned the level one online already so you can see there a little bit of uh, what it covers off maintenance activities uh, equipment and machinery um safe use of equipment and machinery uh, materials um and sort of the whys and the do's and don'ts around application and the uh, the effects of incorrect usage of some of those materials and you can also see we've got a, a whole host of um online courses now that are available so you can start at level one and uh, and work your way through. Should you uh, should you wish to do so? Next slide, please, Ian. So I'll just probably take a pause there just to ask if anybody's got any questions on what I've covered before I jump uh, feet first into pitch power in a bit more detail. We just got um, one comment in the chat from Colin. Talking it, about, it wasn't uh, sensible, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, I wasn't going to give you a sensible answer. I don't, <laughs> don't worry. Um, yeah, just around quality of the football. How do you qualify quality of football? I won't tell you the team that I support, because that's <laughs> definitely not quality football at this moment in time. Um, but thanks for the comment nonetheless. We've got one, so we're happy. Oh, that's good. Obviously, we uh, obviously we want to be uh, encouraging everybody to play uh, tippy tappy, <laughs> silky football on, on good surfaces. So um, yeah, the the way that we the way that we base the gradings is uh, obviously on the data that you input and the images that you provide. Um, that goes into a calculator um, called Performance Quality Standards Calculator, and basically provides a grade for the pitch. So the old style of what we used to do, where we came out and did. Um, a full performance quality standards assessment of your surface and then came out with a pitch grade. It's the same same criteria and the same methodology, um, but essentially it gives you kind of an agronomic quality grade of your pitch from poor, basic, good or advanced. Or if, uh, if you are doing a lot of work and spending a lot of money, you may even come out at high, in which case you'll, uh, you'll get the, the gold standard from, uh, from me but um, most are between poor and advanced that, uh, that we deal with a uh, grassroots standard. Yeah, Julia, no, that's question. Darren, oh, sorry. Our, um, sorry. Oh, go on, Colin, sorry. Uh, as you say, our, um, our sector, secretary, Darren, he, uh, he can't come tonight, um, but uh, he came on it last year and he sent me uh, the, uh, yeah, the pitch power assessment tool that he did kind of last year and it comes with kind of various recommendations and stuff. So yeah. we, do, we do have a bit of a, Got a bit of a plan kind of based on our budget and stuff like that in terms of kind of uh, fertilizer application being kind of the, the the best thing we can do in the spring so uh, so yeah look it looks very very um very um uh thorough you know, the little app the recommendations looks really good yeah so hopefully it'll all make a little bit more sense once we've been through the next uh, the next few slides so i appreciate it's new to to everyone <clears throat> Sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, so what was the purpose of pitch power? As I, as I kind of already touched on already, the the way that we used to do things was that myself and the other regional pitch advisors would basically drive around our regions, visit clubs, um, do the assessments, write the reports. Um, and the problem with that was is that even in a very busy year, um, I was probably getting around... 120 sites there or thereabouts um in the just over 12 months since pitch power has launched it's enabled us to get reports out to um 2700 or so sites um between the six rpa so you can do the maths it's a it's a huge uplift in terms of the amount of sites and pitches that we're able to offer support to um it also significantly potentially reduces the time it takes for you to receive reports. We have a commitment to complete your reports within 21 days in the busiest periods, but I think our average at the moment is about 11 days. Um, 
So in, in, the, in the very busy periods around the end of the submission window, it, it may run to as much as 21, but certainly from my perspective, I'll try and get them out to you much sooner than that. <clears throat> um, your pitch power report essentially provides season ongoing advice about how to improve your pitch. So as I was saying, the idea is that you provide a submission every six months and that kind of allows me to give you advice um, when it's appropriate in terms of whether it's the start of the playing season and sort of giving you advice and support around how to prepare your pitch for the winter months and potentially the works you might want to consider doing sort of pre-winter and then equally it hopefully provide you with information around what you should be looking to do end of season um, and making the most of the grant funding that you may be able to access. It works for a combination of photographs. So those of you that have completed it will have seen that um, we ask you to take a number of photographs and then on the basis of that information that you provide, uh, it comes through to a dashboard to me to assess. Um, there are also user guides and instructional videos within uh, the app itself. So if you do get stuck on um, how do I do a certain measurement or what is it meant to look like, you can click on the link and it will it will take you through to that. Um, and it is important that um, on each pitch that you've received funding for or for each pitch that you want to apply for funding that you do do the assessment on every single pitch. Um, and I would ask, if possible, that you provide unique images for every area uh, that you assess. So I have had uh, multiple pitch sites come in before where the same images have been taken and I've had to sort of return them and ask them politely to, to provide bespoke images because um, the idea is, is that the pitch maintenance funding is given on a per pitch basis. Uh, next slide, please, Ian. Julian, we just had a question come in. Yes, it's from Mark. It says, I've joined the Football Foundation last year. Yeah. Just completed my first year. Is this still active or do I need to restart again now? Phil has left. So presumably, Mark, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free. You're talking with regards to pitch power that you've that you've joined previously. Yeah, I met well, Phil. I met Phil last year with um Jody from Suffolk FA. So yes. we just completed the first year, um, went through all the funding stage and um, reseeded, um, vertically drained twice. And it's really improved. Um, and we got our first payment last December. So um, does that carry on now? Am I still going to go yeah. through the second year? Yeah, so what you'll, what you'll need to do, Mark, Ian, and, and Matt might correct me, because it's, it's probably their stronger area than mine, but there should be a claim form on your foundation grant management portal that you can complete to um, draw down the second year's money. Um, so that, that should be the process in terms of you accessing your second year's funding. It's normally it's normally you're able to do it kind of 12 months on. So if it's December, then you should be able to draw that down any anytime soon, hopefully. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Yeah, that should be on there. Um, I would say, if not, then drop Matt, drop Matt and know, and he'll be able to pick that up with a contact within the foundation for you. Brilliant, thank you. Great stuff. Do you want to jump on to the next slide, Ian, please? So I'm just going to go through kind of briefly what's involved in, in setting up. Um, apologies to those of you that have used the tool already. Um, so <clears throat> essentially, Pitch Power is described as an app, but it's essentially a, a web page within a browser. So we recommend that you access it through uh, Google Chrome rather than Internet Explorer, uh, just because it, it works better. Essentially, you can use it um, both on mobile or on a desktop. Um, and essentially, you will come to the login page, as you can see here, where it says create an account. Uh, using your mobile device or the desktop, you sign into that, provide your email and password. Um, you will be sent a um, validation email to your email address. And then once you click on that, you should be good to go. And the next thing that it will ask you to do is to find your organization from a drop down list. Um, 
if you can't find your organization you can add it and then once you've done that um, you can search for the address of the ground that you maintain or use and then it'll ask you to add the pitches um, that you use yeah so somebody made a good point around the uh, around the app being tricky if you're struggling with phone signal um we are we are working on a document that will go out with the grants in future to kind of give a little bit of guidance around functionality and usability i think the thing to say is that if you once you've used the app once and you've got an idea of what you need to take in terms of pitch images and the information that you need to provide you can actually do all of the preamble adding your pitches adding maintenance information um, equipment information budgets any training that you might have done all of that info can be done from the comfort of your own home so you can do all of that at home it's really only the pitch inspection element that you need to do on site uh, and one option that it does give you as you'll see as we go through the slides is it does actually give you the option to select the images that you need to provide from either your camera live or if you are struggling with phone signal it'll allow you to select them from a folder <clears throat> so if you do travel to site or it's an area that you know you struggle with mobile phone signal you can just take the images that you need in advance and then when you do get to home or somewhere where you've got wi-fi or access to the internet then you can add, add uh, those images and measurements um, at a later date there is also a um paper version of the app that you can download uh from the web for foundation website if you want somewhere to write your measurements down uh, and a reminder of kind of what you you need to take um, but that's kind of the best way to to get around any sites where you struggle for for mobile phone signal you move on to the next slide please Ian. there you go so once you've once you've signed up and you've uh you've added your organization your sites um, you'll see there on the left that uh, there's a pitch that's been installed there on a google earth image so essentially when you add your pictures it will enable you to plot them onto a map um, and then you it'll come up with uh, if it's a full-size pitch it'll ask you for two goal areas and a center circle if it's a mini soccer pitch it will now only ask you for one goal area and center circle um, and then, as I said, you can provide information around the maintenance equipment. Um, it's, it's, it's really useful for me in terms of making sure that your reports are as bespoke as possible um, to get information about the maintenance equipment that's used on the site, even if it isn't you doing the maintenance. I appreciate that sometimes not easy to get a hold of, but it's really helpful for me to know what kits being used to maintain your pitches, um, what budget you've got um and also crucial to kind of list the activities that are being carried out so mowing you know how frequently it's mown line marking how frequently is it marked out uh particularly those of you that have accessed the grant already to to kind of let me know um what's been done using your grant uh since your previous inspection um and for us obviously one of the main areas that we want to <clears throat> make improvements is reducing cancellations. Um, so I think there was 150,000 cancelled fixtures in 2019 when we had the uh, the dreadful winter. So obviously a big, big part of this pitch improvement journey is trying to bring the amount of cancellations right down. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of a, a big, big reason for, for this whole pitch improvement journey. In next slide, please, Ian. <coughs> What makes for a good pitch power report? So I touched on it a little bit already, but us as regional pitch advisors, we are kind of reliant on well-completed inspections to kind of provide the context and information to provide you with a high quality report. Um, so yeah, all the equipment used to maintain the pitches, um, maintenance practices completed and the frequency of those, um, any training that you've completed, and then really it's the accuracy of the images that you're asked to provide around grass height, surface profile, soil profile and line markings. Um, and then the additional information section, um, 
there is going to be an upgrade and an update to pitch power that we've imaginatively called pitch power 2.0 that will be launched in the spring um, that should be a lot more intuitive and you'll get pop-ups and notifications to kind of support you as you go through the app and provide your reminders on <clears throat> when you need to provide your submissions. Um, but really, really helpful in its current version to kind of use that additional information section. If you've got anything else uh, regarding your pitches or machinery that you're not able to kind of express through the information that we ask you for, um, and that additional information section, you know, for instance, if you're suffering with, with pests and diseases damage, um, if you're interested in irrigation or drainage or you've got particular issues with machinery, you can kind of express that in that section. Uh, where it asks you around cancellations, really from my perspective, that's weather-related cancellations and in particular those that are related to games being rained off due to waterlogging. Um, I think having... Having spent a couple of days in Norfolk and Suffolk last week, there were a lot of sandy soils, but I know large swathes of Suffolk in particular kind of sit on clay. So for those of you that are unfortunate to suffer with, with waterlogging, really important that we're able to capture that and see where the works that you've been doing using your grant monies are making a difference to um, the amount of cancellations that you're suffering. Um, and as I said, the more comprehensively the sections are completed, the, the more kind of bespoke and individual your pitch power report will be. Next slide, please, Ian. So this gives you a little bit of an example of kind of what a good, uh, a well-completed equipment section uh, looks like. You can see they've listed the compact tractor, a line marker, and the mowing equipment they've got access to, what condition it's in, uh, year of manufacture, and the <clears throat> the model uh, for those of you that are interested in applying for small grants for replacement or new machinery this information is kind of absolutely key because this will be where i will look at the number of pitches you've got your kind of maintenance set up in terms of is it volunteers is it contractor etc and this is on the basis of this unless you've provided me with any other information it'll kind of be on this basis that i'll make recommendations around machinery um so for instance if your tractor was 10 years old and in poor condition i might well recommend a new tractor uh, if i can see that you are a site with lots of pitches and you there is a piece of equipment that isn't listed that you might benefit from again i'll recommend that and that is on that basis that the full foundation will uh, support your grant or not so if you apply for a piece of equipment that hasn't been recommended by myself in your pitch power report um, they won't kind of turn it down flat, but they'll say you need to go back to the regional pitch advisor to uh, write an email of, of support for that. So it's just more straightforward for yourselves <clears throat> if you can do it within the information you're asked to provide. Next slide, please, Ian. Yeah, now this is kind of a, <laughs> if Carlsberg did maintenance information, this is a little bit what it would look like. Um, but um, this is probably a best case scenario. I'm not asking anybody to necessarily provide this level of detail, but um, certainly listing the works that have been done. Uh, Mark mentioned earlier, you know, deep spiking, you know, fertilization seeding, absolutely critical for me. If you can kind of say, you know, since we last did a pitch power report, this is what we've been doing. Um, and that really gives me the basis to kind of see, well, where were your pitches at? And your last inspection and where are they at now and have the works that i've recommended and you have hopefully completed and um, what impact have they had on pitch quality next slide please Ian. so i'm going to kind of go through this really quickly I'm, hopefully this video will play but this is just an example of some of the guidance videos that are available in the app um and it kind of gives you instruction on on how to take the images and there is one of these for each um each area that where you're asked to capture so fingers crossed it, it plays we'll give it a go <laughs> um you're testing us now so let's see if it works we might not get any sound we've had this previously but we'll give it a go
don't know whether it's going to work, Julian. No, I can answer it. It's not. No problem. So you're asked to um, provide measurements, but as I said, you can see you can see here where it says on the right hand side in the middle, need help with this. Watch the video. Essentially, if you click on that when you're in the app, it'll take you through to a video of exactly what the measurement looks like in the new version of the app that launches in spring. This image will pop up, so hopefully it will serve as a reminder to people using it, kind of what the image needs to look like. But essentially, this is what the grass height image needs to look like. And basically, we're looking for kind of the average of the grass height across um, across the uh, the tape measure there. And you can see that that's running at about 30 millimetres, and it'll ask you to kind of pop in what the average grass length is there. And as I said, where you can see where it says take a photo there, if you click on that, <clears throat> it gives you the option to either take the photo live or provide a previously um, taken photograph if uh, if you do struggle with with phone signal. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And you can find all the um, the guidance videos on uh, Foundation's YouTube channel as well, which Matt's obviously been watching uh, intently. He's not shaking his head, so I'm assuming he's been he's been watching it. Next slide, please, Ian. Yeah, and similarly, how to uh, to take a picture of the service profile. So essentially, from from kind of waist height, holding it out directly in front of you, trying to keep any boots or shoes out of the image if possible. And that, as you can see, that gives us a really good bird's eye view of the surface profile where you are. It is worthwhile saying that I've got a bit of a gripe with the request to take a picture of your goal mouse because at this time of year, we would expect a lot of the goal mouse to be bare. And obviously that isn't necessarily a reflection of your pitch quality. So I normally suggest that sort of people take them in an area that's kind of reflective of the goal area as a whole. So the general condition of the six yard box. Um, so sometimes kind of around the six yard line can be a good place. Again, that that sort of phraseology should be updated in the in the new app. But you know, if you've got a fantastic pitch but your goal mouse have been hammered, we, you know, we obviously want to be able to, to assess the pitch accurately. Uh, and in the in the updated version of the app, we will ask to have a wide angled image or give us a bit of a, an overview of the pitch as a whole, which should be able to, to capture that a bit better. But that's what we want the surface profile to look like. Next slide, please, Ian. And then similarly, in terms of measuring the root depth, so you can see there you've kind of got the whole soil profile there. Um, and then what I'd normally say is if you can kind of take this image when the soil profile is kind of intact, but then um, kind of break away the soil at the bottom, just sort of crumble it away with your fingers to kind of expose the roots and get a bit of a picture of, uh, of where the root depths are. That's probably sort of the best way to, to do that. Next slide, please, Ian. Just to jump in, Julian. Oh, there you go. I was going to say there are less invasive methods than as we found out um, yeah. the other day with a spade in the ground digging a triangle out. And that equipment can be purchased through the funding once you've had the funding. So it can't be purchased prior to doing your assessment. But once you've had the assessment, uh, got your first round of funding, if you're eligible, you can then use that funding to purchase one of those, which is a little bit of a, a less invasive method for your, at least for your first team pitches anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, you can you can purchase um, you can purchase that core there using your grant. You can get part of the uh part of the cost covered by your um by using your grass pitch maintenance funding grant um <clears throat> and you say it takes a nice a nice neat core out as opposed to um having to take a profile out although for me it's lovely to have a full view of the of the profile um so in terms of measuring thatch depths and this is kind of where um it's fairly specialist even even myself looking at images sometimes it can be a little bit tricky we do at our end through our dashboard have the ability to amend any measurements that you provide so don't get too caught up if you're not 100 percent sure on the measurements that you're providing because we will look at every image that you send in and every bit of data that you send in and make sure it kind of corresponds with um with what you've provided so if you're not too sure then don't don't worry too much but again there is a 
a bit of text there that explains it and again a, a guidance video that you can access next uh, slide please in and then finally i'll ask you to provide a picture of your line marking so as it stands this is a really good opportunity to take a wide angled shot of your pitch um so this image here is kind of great for me because it kind of it shows me a good idea of kind of what the general condition of the pitch is um as well as giving a really good view of the line markings um and for those of you that kind of have done one already for for us in terms of what constitutes a below standard line anything that's been burnt in using herbicide will come out at, at below standard um fairly unusual unless the lines are far too narrow or far too wide most of the time as long as they're not burnt in they'll either come out at standard or above standard um <clears throat> next slide please Ian. Uh, this is the additional information section that I mentioned earlier, so you can you can reflect your cancellations. Um, really good as well, if you can, for each individual pitch, kind of to let me know how many hours it's used a week. So um, interestingly, and, and this has been raised on a few visits recently, um, are we talking now or are we talking the summer when the pitches are being trained on a lot and you've got the daylight hours? I think my answer to that would be kind of what's the usage been like in the previous six months. So, um, so yeah, if you've got the daylight hours and your pitch is sort of being trained on six hours a week and four hours a week matches, then, you know, reflect that if it's one that you're providing in April, May time and you've just been through the winter and it's just been matches, then reflect that. But um, there are kind of guideline uh, weekly hours of use in terms of what, what is a reasonable expectation of a grass pitch to cope with um so it's a really good insight for me to kind of see whether a pitch is being overused whether it's about right um and obviously that plays kind of into the into the quality of the pitch as well uh, <clears throat> next slide please Ian. and this provides a little bit i appreciate this isn't very easy to see so hopefully when the slides go out you can kind of zoom in and have a look a little bit before but it does give you a bit of an insight into what the thresholds are so i appreciate when you get a grade for your pitch you might be a bit confused as to how we've reached uh reached that figure or that grading um, and this gives you a little bit of criteria here as to kind of what constitutes what so at this time of year, if your grass coverage isn't meeting 71%, then it's unlikely that your pitch will come out as good graded. Um, yeah, sorry, just picked up a question about the soil sample. I'll come on to in a minute. But um, yeah, the uh, so yeah, it gives you a bit of a bit of an idea there. The surface profile image is sort of scored out of 100 squares. So you get that nice 100 square overlay um when uh when you take the image um so if you've got for example high weed content and a little bit of bare ground so for argument's sake if your bare ground's 10 percent but you've got kind of 19 percent weeds um then that's going to constitute sort of 29 percent weeds or bare ground which is going to mean you might just about scrape a good grade but if it's any more than that you're going to drop below that so that's kind of why the weed control is kind of the very first thing that we focus on if <clears throat> if you have got uh, weeds, because that's kind of one of the easiest ways for you to improve uh, your pitch grading. But I'll let you uh, have a look at that in your in your own time. Next slide, please, Ian. Julian, we've got a couple of questions yeah. that have come in. Uh, <clears throat> the first relates to where can I get a recommended soil sampler? And is there a, a grant for one? So yeah. Matt, Matt has already kind of covered the point that you, you can't get a grant for one, but if you've received a grant, you can use a proportion of those monies to procure one is what we've seen with a number of projects. In terms of <clears throat> where you can get them from, June, is there's anywhere that you can not necessarily recommend, but you can point people in the direction to? Yeah, so, so the, um, the, the soil sampler that um, you can use your grass pitch maintenance funding towards is, is BMS. Uh, so it's a company called BMS and it's called an impact soil sampler mm. um, and that's the one that you can you can use that is probably the only time you'll ever hear me 
make a direct recommendation because they're the only they're the only company that manufacture those so okay fairly uh, safe ground there yeah thank you second question um if pitch is used um for almost relentless cricket during the summer yeah. um what would would you expect that to be reflected in the usage hours um no the one thing that it will the one thing that it will ask is um are there other sports in use on the site so it will allow yeah. you to select from athletics cricket etc um so obviously that will kind of influence my recommendations in terms of timing of works how quickly the pitches are kind of returned to a height of cut that's suitable for for winter sports etc um but the wear and tear on areas that are kind of shared cricket and junior football pitches or senior football pitches most of kind of the wear from cricketers running around on the outfield is relatively negligible um compared to to football um, so that that you know you wouldn't need to reflect that in terms of hours of usage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lovely. That's it. Thank you. I will mute and then. Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was going to sort of. This is one of the the horrors that is is um, affecting kind of particularly the sandy soils in in Norfolk and Suffolk at the moment. So I'm, I'm going to touch on talk about chafe of grub um damage particularly just just very briefly and there are there are six species in the uk um and essentially they uh emerge from the soil in in may time um mate and lay eggs um in june um and the problem why the reason why these grubs are a problem is because when they lay in the soil, they then feed on the roots. Uh, and basically, as they get more mature, um, the birds and the pests start to, to feed on them. So crow damage, badgers, foxes, etc., can start to um, tear and dig into the soil. Um, one of kind of the first telltale signs will be kind of pre- bird damage or pet or sort of badger or foxes damage will be if you start to get a yellowing of the turf or kind of visible turf stress um it might be worthwhile just kind of getting your spade in the ground and having a little dig um in the affected areas just to kind of make sure that there isn't any evidence of that because that can be kind of the first telltale sign but they are particularly prevalent um on sandy soils on sites that are tree or shrub lined um, so if you have got pitches that are kind of surrounded by trees and shrubs and you have got sandy soils then you need to be really vigilant to these because they can um, as I've seen recently and sites in Norfolk they can kind of come relatively out of nowhere and in particular summers that tend to be damper and, uh, and, and fairly mild um, you can get a real surge in, in grub population um, and it can do a huge amount of damage to a surface. So I'm just going to kind of touch on some of the areas next that we can we can look to, <clears throat> to repair our region. Move on to the next slide, Ian, please. So when are they a problem? So as I said, they, they kind of become most apparent when they feed on the roots early autumn and into the winter. Um, at this time of year, they'll start to kind of move down deeper in the soil. So normally they're sort of found probably between four to five centimetres down in the soil, but they can go as deep as 15 centimetres over the winter months. Um, so that is where preventing and reducing their impact, first and foremost, is really important. So. Any work that you do should be sort of based on the life cycle of the pest. So firstly, making sure and identifying that it is in fact chafer groups that are bothering you. Um, they do tend to like pitches that are um, infrequently maintained or those that have got a lot of organic matter and thatch buildup. So 
scarification in the spring and trying to really minimize that organic matter and such that you've got in your pitches um, is one way of doing that if you are on pitches that are susceptible to chafer grubs uh, rotary mowing using a, a ride on mower um, or if you're feeling energetic pedestrian mower and collecting in late may and june will help to kind of disrupt uh, the adult mating and egg laying process it's really that period when they're laying in the turf that we really want to try and disrupt them as as much as we possibly can um kind of anecdotally the rolling of pitches although that's something that we normally would never advocate because it compacts the soils and it's bad for for the turf anecdotally rolling during that kind of egg laying period can be effective in um helping to kind of disturb that mating and, and egg laying process in the soil um so anything anything that can be really done to um disturb them during that period is really beneficial as i said low thatch levels are associated with lower impact infestation so keeping on top of your thatch and your organic matter is really crucial um, and another way of disturbing um, the chafer beetle when they are mating is to put pheromone traps in um, bushes and trees. I mean, you can get specific um, specific guidance from whatever pheromone lure that you you purchase, but essentially they normally kind of cover two thousand square meters, which equates to sort of just under a third of a full size pitch. Um, and basically they will help to essentially trap the beetles um, and prevent them from uh, from laying laying their eggs. Um, next slide, please, Ian. So how can we deal with the chafer larvae once they are already in the soil? So there aren't any um, approved chemicals for chafer control anymore. There used to be a product called Acceloprin um, that was licensed for use. Um, that is still under emergency authorization at given periods of the year for golf courses, racetracks and airfields, but there isn't an authorization for sports pitches. So use of that chemical on sports pitches isn't, <coughs> isn't approved. Um, some companies are off offering biological control through the use of nematodes. So they're essentially small parasites that, um, that basically enter the grub and destroy it. The problem with those in a grassroots environment is that the soil conditions have to be suitable for a two week period. So if you've got access to irrigation and you can keep your soils moist and warm, um, then you've, you've got a bit of a shot. But if you haven't got access to irrigation, um, unless you're very lucky and Mother Nature plays ball for kind of a two week period, you really need that water to bring them into contact with the grub. Um, otherwise you will be wasting your money and it is a pretty expensive treatment to go down that route. Um, shallow aeration techniques, and this is where it's kind of really important to get a bit of an idea of the life cycle of the larvae and kind of where they are in the soil, so how deep they are. Um, shallow aeration techniques, particularly kind of in the early part of the autumn, um, when the larvae are quite young and quite high in the soil, they can be quite effective in uh, in disturbing the grubs. Um, so using combination grooming tools like quadruplay or slitters, dimple spikers, etc., anything that can really be done to disturb the <coughs> grubs when they're in the soil. Um, and, it, and it's kind of important to say that in 2018, when we kind of had that drought summer where seemingly it kind of didn't rain for three months, the eggs need moisture to basically turn into larvae and, and grow. Um, so in a very dry summer, we normally associate those with less damage and, and, and reduced chafer grub populations in the autumn. We've just experienced a relatively consistent amount of <clears throat> wet, mild summer that's just been. And, and this is why we're seeing particularly bad damage this autumn. 
Um, and, and largely that's what it's being put down to. So that's why we kind of get some years where um, it's, you know, some years where it's better than others. Um, I think somebody's just just mentioned as well, leather jackets, which are the larvae of the crane fly, have got a different life cycle um, that create just as devastating levels of, of damage. Um, yeah, somebody's just mentioned about chain harrowing. So similarly, similarly chain harrowing will kind of help to disturb them. And, and I think, again, anything that can be done in kind of that June time when the when the egg laying is happening to kind of disturb them, whether it's mowing, harrowing, grooming of the, the turf, anything that can really be done to disturb them um, will help. Um, and, and also the thing with chain hiring as well is it will help to kind of disturb that organic matter that they like to to lay into and feed on. Um, so yeah, it's a worthwhile a worthwhile exercise in kind of that, that time of year. Um, in terms of repairing areas once already damaged, <clears throat> prevention is obviously better than cure. So kind of this is where the grant maintenance funding comes in and kind of enabling you to do a lot of the works that will help to improve your pitch, but um, regular cultural practices such as, you know, frequent mowing, frequent uh, surface grooming, whether it's brushing, raking, um, slitting of the pitches when the conditions are right, all of that will help to um, improve pitch health. And then crucially, those tasks combined with fertilization and deep spiking, et cetera, will help your pitch to recover from the damage from root loss. Um, so one of the sites that I work with in Lincolnshire, nine pitch site, when we started working with them in 2018, they had nine pitches that were decimated by chafe club damage. None of them were usable. Um, and through signing up to their grant, purchasing their own maintenance equipment, getting their maintenance regime right they've now got all nine pitches back in use and their latest pitch power assessment every single one of those was at the advanced standard so all is not lost if you do suffer from this damage it's just now we haven't got that silver bullet chemical solution it's a bit of a longer road back but there is support available um and you know you've just got to kind of stick at it and, and generally year on year the damage gets less and less as we sort of minimize the environment in which those groups thrive um yeah in terms of repairs <clears throat> if you've got small areas that are affected kind of taking the loose material away mixing the material in a in a wheelbarrow with some sport sand and seed when when conditions are appropriate you can kind of uh pan pan shovel that across the areas in small amounts and kind of bring it bring it to a level um the critical thing if you're doing that method is kind of doing it doing it little and often um using germination sheeting to kind of help speed up the germination of the seed in those areas and, and protect it a little more um if the damage is kind of greater than 50 millimeters you might find that returfing is your only option but that can be very expensive if it's over a large area so there are other methods if the damage is very severe that can be looked at so there's such as um coring off and, and repairs like that but i'm not going to sort of dig into that in too much detail because it's very site specific um but there is a there are two dedicated learning cards on the highly uh, high learning groundskeeping community one on shape damage uh, and one on uh leather jackets so if you do want to have a look at those in more detail or kind of talk to me about sort of specific issues you might be having, then please just give me a ring or, or drop me an email and we can kind of start the um, journey to supporting you with, <coughs> with that. Uh, next slide, please, Ian. There we go. And I'll, um, I'll pass over to Matt. It might be a good time to just have any questions that there might be. Yeah, sure. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to either um, unmute yourself or alternatively um, drop something in the in the chat. But there's some really good advice. I mean, we've got a number of clubs here in Norfolk who are having 
and experiencing this chafer grub issue at the moment. I know how decimating it is and disheartening it is for clubs to, to have it done to the pitches, in particular pitches where previously a lot of time, effort and energy have gone in to get them to a to a decent standard. So um, frustration is that there's no immediate treatment that we can have to implement, but I guess just to echo what Julian mentioned around the, the prevention is, is the best cure. So the more proactive we can be through um, interventions such as utilising Pitch Power app, grass pitch maintenance fund, more chance we've got of nipping this nipping this situation in the bud. Um, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Chris, just to come in, so we'll circulate Julian's email address um, when we circulate the slide deck and a copy of the recording tomorrow. Matt, I will pass over to yourself. Yeah, no, I, I think it's worth mentioning just before we go into the small grants and how it can um, kind of apply to the ground stuff is that the grass pitch maintenance fund is, is on a tapered, I think we said there at the start, it's a tapered approach to funding. So just to give you a, a little bit of an idea, if you've just give you some figures, really, if you're um, like to this a six year program, um, forgive me if some of you are already on it or if you're on the old scheme. Um, if you have a, a poor or basic pitch, uh, 11 v 11, you're entitled to up to two and a half thousand pound a year over those six years. Um, sorry, each year over six years. And then it kind of tapers down for nine v nine is two grand and mini soccer pitches are, are 1500 quid. So there's a good amount of money in the grass pitch maintenance. Um, so if you're spending anywhere near that on your grass pitch maintenance, it's well worth having that pitch power assessment done. And the pitch power seems to be the, the key to unlocking not only small grants, but the grass pitch maintenance as well. So I just thought I'd touch on that just very quickly before we do small grants. Um, so small grants, it is, again, it's, it's a Football Foundation funding part. I'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail on this because not everything is going to be applicable to everyone on the call. Um, but in a nutshell, small grants is up to £25,000 um, available per club. Now, that doesn't mean it's only £25,000, it's £25,000 per application. Um, there is kind of a don't apply every day, but you can apply more than once. It's kind of the unwritten rule on that one. So anything from goalposts, portable floodlights, storage containers, storage container, sorry, um, perimeter fencing, Clubhouse pavilion refurbs, all those can be can be looked at for the twenty five thousand um, pounds. But for you guys, really, it's it's around grass pitch main, maintenance, kind of maintenance equipment and machinery and grass pitch drainage items. So this is really where you guys will come in and working with the clubs, working with the CFAs um, and the GMA to kind of figure out where your shortfalls are. And so your pitch power will kind of come up with that. So you'll put all your machinery and you'll put your your current kind of maintenance programs in and what drainage you've got, things like that. And the pitch power report will come back to say, actually, we recommend, or Julian will recommend X, Y, and Z. And that's where you can then apply for, through the small grants up to 25K um, for that. Now, there is a, an expectation that the Football Foundation will fund up to 75% of that. So that means you guys just have to match fund the rest of it, depending on the costings. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't use other funding sources to do that. Um, so, for example, in Suffolk, we've got the Community Action Suffolk Fund at the minute, which is to help clubs come out of COVID, although it seems like we might be back in it again in a minute. Um, so you can use that to match funds. You can use your club funds, any any sort of grants you've got through government and local authority. Am I, am I right in saying as well, Matt, that, the, um, that, that that's kind of, it's up to 31,250, so like the 25K figure is the full granted amount so the, the the total project cost can be 31 250 so i just wanted to clarify yeah. that sometimes people with their machinery by the time they're putting a tractor and a grooming tool etc it sort of comes to over 25 and they're like oh we can't afford it and i'm like no you can it's just uh, it's, it's find the rest of it yeah so it, it's kind of it's the 25 grand plus the 25 percent that that you've got to find essentially yeah yeah so like i said there are there are some expectations to to fund part of it, part of it is the club themselves. But again, for the foundation, there is money in the game at the minute. So let's try and eke out what we can across across Suffolk and Norfolk. Um, Ian, I don't know if you want to add anything onto that, but it's kind of a whistle stop tour on on small grants. Like I said, pitch power is the is the key. So my ask to every club on the call and every every club that isn't on the call to try and get as many pitch power assessments done as we can. Um, I suppose a caveat to that is if your pitches are already good it may be worth hanging on until they're a little bit worse off um, 
just because then you could be entitled to more to more funding um, as they as the season progresses. And if we have a really poor winter and we're saying that some of the leagues are front loading, and we could all be finished by March. That's a really really good point, actually, Matt. I, I, you know, I, I said to some people before, you know, please don't apply in June and July when your pitches are out there potentially at their best because really what we want to be doing is making sure you're getting the appropriate support when your pitches are at their worst so that's kind of why we ask for that mandatory window but for new applicants you know please be kind of thinking you know between November and March is really when we want to be doing our um, our submission and if you think your pitches are likely or if you know they normally deteriorate kind of Jan Feb time then again just be conscious of of trying to kind of do your submission because we don't want to be giving you £750 for a good rated pitch if really you need two and a half thousand. So, yeah, really good point, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Only, on small grants. Yeah, only a bit for me. I'll, I'll move a slide. I'm the only bit just to reiterate that Matt has said is that previously um, with this grant, um, you could come in once and then you'd have to wait X, X amount of uh, I think it was 24 months it used to be in order to be able to then resubmit where there's no there's no parameters on it now so in a sense that you might come in do a goalpost grant um, be successful and then um, a few months later down the line you need to come in for some pitch perimeter fencing as it was done or perimeter fencing storage containers you can come back in so as and when you need to as a club you can dip into this fund so please make use of that um because candidly, we encourage as all of our clubs in Norfolk, and I know Matt will be doing the same, um, to get as much funding as you can that you're entitled to, because we want to see that investment come into our respective grassroots games in our counties. Um, just finally, then I'm not going to go through this point by point, because you can find yourselves on that list if you're, if you're not here as a club. Um, the only other stipulation is um, around your, your security tenure on your site. So... If you own the site, brilliant, even better. If you've got a long lease, that'll work. If you haven't, or it's a local authority owned pitch and you just rent it, doesn't mean you're not eligible, it just means there's a longer process to go through, uh, which requires the landowner to kind of go through a bit of a, it's not a legal form, because I don't like to use the word, a legal form is a little bit of performer and how that happens. Uh, we like to we all send out the slide decks and that top right hand corner of my screen is the, the guide to small grants that will be a clickable link. It is available on the foundation's website and it just gives you a little bit of a step-by-step kind of a little bit of a Bible on, on everything from, from fencing to goalposts um, to machine, what you can and can't go for. So if we, if we don't cover everything today, you click that link and that should give you a little bit of a Bible. Any questions on small grants that the three of us might be able to answer? I don't know if silence is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> There's nothing in the, in the chat either. But that that guidance document is really good. There isn't anything yeah. in there that um, that is the the Bible, absolutely. So that's very detailed, and covers everything that you need to know about that particular fund, broken down by the respective items that you can procure. So well worth a look. We'll probably what we'll do is we'll circulate the link specifically for that guide as well, within the body of the email that we send out, um, sharing the recording. Yeah, and if there are clubs on here that that. Um... That have pitches that are used for the step system of football. It's just worthwhile saying that most of those items are um, fundable up to um, seventy percent through the football stadium improvement funding. So worthwhile touching on that as well. Um, and I am <clears throat> bullying the FA at the moment to include the grass pitch maintenance funding elements in the uh, in the fundable items for football stadium improvement fund as well. So we'll watch this space on that one, but. Um, but yeah, that there's kind of there is support available wherever you are in the system. So please, please make use of it. As Matt said, there's plenty of money in in the game and the support available at the moment. So one thing I did miss, sorry, well. Julian, is if you're a step club and you have community pitches, although you can't apply for grass pitch maintenance and things like that for your main pitch, you can apply for your community pitches. So if you're a multi pitch site and only the one is used for your step football, you can apply for it for your community. Community, community pitches for youth pitches and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the, that's actually the same for the kind of small grant stuff as well. You can kind of obviously access 
equipment, machinery, etc., through through those community pitches as well. Thank you. Um, we now open the floor up to any questions. So you've heard lots of information over the just north of the hour. Um, any question that anyone's got, as I've said, you can feel free to unmute your microphone or drop a question in in the chat, and then we will endeavour to to answer the, the questions that, that arrive. So we'll just provide that opportunity now. More than happy to answer any general pitch maintenance stuff now or email me or drop me a line after, but, but um, don't be shy, we're all here for the same reason. Must be a lot of Norwich fans desperate to watch the second half of them. <laughs> Hi there, it's, it's, it's Colin from, from Watlington. Um, Ian, this is more, more a question for, you, for yourself, really, just about the, um, about the kind of small grants um, mm. situation. Um, we're in the very early stages of kind of putting plans together for a new kind of permanent um, changing room. So would mm. we be, you know, obviously that's a separate funding stream. Um, would, would you be kind of, would we be affected if we went for kind of funding for the, for the change rooms? Would that affect our chances of trying to, uh, obtain funding for something to do with the pitch at all? No. So actually, we would encourage you to apply for funding for the pitches if you're looking at a bigger project to try and improve your changing rooms. Now, I don't know what, how big the changing room project is, but certainly the Football Foundation would take the approach as they wouldn't want to just invest in a pavilion in a changing room block if there's no... Um, no funding and no love and care going into the pitches because ultimately you can have as good a changing room block as you like but if the pitches aren't playable then it's pointless having great changing rooms so they kind of come hand in hand but no we would in encourage you in the first instance to carry on and continue with the work that you want to do to improve your grass pitches and then we would work with you separately on a longer term project so but that's something that you and I can and the club can have a conversation of around, uh, off offline from here, so yep. we can we can set that up for a conversation certainly. Yeah, I've, I don't know that they've they've got a um, a couple of the committee have gone to a Paris Council meet tonight and that, but I'll, I'll speak to them about that because we have yes we've got some early drafts and that. So is is now a good a good time to get kind of contact you and speech about that before we get too too much further into it? Yeah, that'd be yeah. useful. Yeah, great. Right. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Charlotte, you've got your hand up as well, so please feel free to um, to, to unmute and then um, fire your question in. Another one on uh, on the wife's computer, so uh, it's not just a lady with a gruff voice. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, guys. Appreciate the presentation. Um, just a quick question relating to, well, kind of just an observation, really. We've, you give us the tools. You give us there's loads of information that's really good yeah it's all proven techniques on how to get you know your pitch up to good standards yeah you know, obviously a lot of those the timings of when you're carrying out a lot of the work uh, is you know fairly seasonal and but unfortunately what we've found is with the best will in the world sometimes all you need is a a bit of luck because if you get what we did where you, we spent over a thousand pounds worth on grass seed and then it didn't rain for 70 days and was 30 degrees or 25 degrees or whatnot. I think some of that's just down to luck, but other, other is it, you, you know what you need to do, but given climate change and the crazy weather that we have and spring, whatever that might look like, sometimes you just need like a, a little bit of confidence from you know, an expert to say, actually, now's a really good time, given the pitch power report that you've sent us to do this or don't do it now wait until we've had two weeks worth of rain or whatever it might be and I think sometimes it's those decisions about when do we crack on we know what we want to do but and we know when we should do it but is now actually the right time to do it so if you can give us any indication on yeah what's, well, I mean, what's the best case to do there I don't know yeah well I mean that's that's kind of what I'm here for if you're you know I get some of my sites off my some of my clubs off my old patch will sort of bombard me via DMs on Twitter or you know give me a ring or an email and just say oh, I've just got this quick question you know do you think we're timing this right should we hold off what's the weather doing um, 
so that's what I'm here for. You can go on to the groundskeeping community and kind of ask that that question similarly. Um, hopefully, hopefully the information that you get in your pitch power assessment kind of gives a little bit context to that. So it will normally kind of say, um, if you are on a site without irrigation, it can sometimes be worth hedging your bets and kind of doing your seeding at half rate in the spring and half rate in the autumn. So that if you do get a very dry late spring early summer you kind of not you've not kind of completely put all your eggs in one basket in terms of your seeding i think the other thing to say as well is that obviously the the pitch improvement journey is kind of a six-year one for a reason and we kind of we recognize that sometimes the availability of contractors or timing weather conditions you know we don't have the resources available to the professional end to kind of manipulate a lot of what we're doing and give us the great the you know the best climatic conditions all of the time so i think um you know don't be afraid to to contact myself or a colleague or the support pitch advisor for for your particular county and ask a question around the time of your operations you know the east anglia is notoriously dry compared to the rest of the country so it might be that we have to approach things slightly differently where you are uh, as opposed to as opposed to other parts so yeah give me a ring thanks guys appreciate it june um just another question that's that's come in um they have a major chafer grub problem at the moment is it worth investing in bird scarers or something a lot of that ilk um yeah and where would you look for these yeah potentially so i mean obviously um Obviously, the, the grubs themselves are an issue, but the main sort of damage comes from the, from the things feeding on them. So anything you can do to control or um, deter them. Um, bird scarers are one option, although they may not be permitted if you're near residential housing. Um, lasers are something else that have been used with some success. The problem with crows is that they're very clever. And there isn't much that deters them for very long. Um, but a lot of, um, yeah, any kind of options. I think I'd probably kind of say probably the most experienced people with regards to this are probably kind of in agriculture and farmers to kind of talk to. I wouldn't be able to kind of steer you in any particular direction in terms of pest deterrence. Um, but I'm sure with a little bit of creative Googling, you probably find some support there but but certainly in rural parts if you've got contacts kind of within agriculture worthwhile asking them what their thoughts are on deterrence for um for birds particularly um and also worthwhile having a, a bit of a search on the gov.uk page to find out kind of what the latest legislation is on potential control of any of the um feeding pests as well Thank you, Julian. We had um, an A. Loveday who unmuted themselves, still unmuted. Did you want to ask a question? Hello there. Hi. Um, hello, Julian. Um, Hi. I've uh, just received uh, the middle of this November uh, your um, report on pitch power. This was at Thurlow, which is between Haverhill and Newmarket. Yeah. And um, you made the comment that we've had significant increase in weed population, which I specifically took some of the uh, pictures to show that we had had more weed. And one yes. of the reasons why we had more weed is because um, we compete both senior teams and youth teams all in the Cambridgeshire League. They carried on playing football competitively up until the end of June and yeah. then started playing again friendlies um set the senior team from the second week of july yeah and so i didn't really have much time to do any weed control so i really needed to sort of show that and one of the particular weeds that we have got is plantain weed have you got any suggestions for the control of plantain weed yeah so yeah i mean obviously the extension of the playing season a little bit of an exceptional well hopefully yeah. <laughs> yeah, exceptional scenario 
um, and you know messed around some of the end of season timings and works that we normally do in terms of dealing with plantain. Most um, most good quality broad spectrum selective herbicides will treat plantain effectively. Um, I think what I would say in terms of my recommendations in the pitch power report is that kind of timing is fairly critical. So if the pitch is under drought conditions, the chemical won't tend to be terribly effective because the weeds kind of need to be actively growing to, to take it in. Um, it can be quite useful to mix in some um, liquid fertilizer with the uh, selective herbicide to kind of aid the uptake um, by plantains. But, but generally speaking, if it's being uh, applied professionally via a spray uh, herbicide, then, then most of the broad spectrum herbicides should treat plantain. Um, but if you look at the if you look at the product label for the given herbicide, um, that should tell you what weeds it treats. One of the ones that we often have trouble with is clover, because there are only certain selected herbicides that treat for clover, and a lot of clubs will mistakenly think that when they have their pitches treated for weeds, that it's going to shift the clover as well. Um, and if you are having it applied by a contractor or a professional, that's kind of where having the conversation with them around what product they're using and is it treating the weeds that you've got on your pitches um, is, is kind of really crucial to make sure you're getting the, the best bang for your, your book. Hopefully that answers your question. Second. I, I have got another question on yeah. um, top dressing before or after 30 draining. Um, depends what you're trying to achieve if um if you're wanting to leave more of the material on your surface and try and aid with um aid with deviations or playability and ball roll you're probably better off doing it beforehand if you're really wanting to kind of get it into the holes and improve and ameliorate the quality of your soils then probably brushing it in or drag matting it in after application uh, is the way to go you'll tend to lose more of it by um by doing it after and sort of brushing it in um alternatively if brushing it and drag matting in isn't an option then uh, you can obviously do it beforehand and that will punch a certain amount into the soil as well so it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve by doing the top dressing really yeah, well one of the things that we've noticed this year is that we've had less uh, worm cast is that something that uh, you've noticed around uh, your area or not um I think it's going to be massively variable depending on soil types um and where you are in the country acidic acidic soils tend to suffer less sandy slightly acidic acidic soils suffer less with worm casts as a general rule um, clay soils or soils that are alkaline can, can get a lot of worm activity um, and they tend to I mean it's interesting you say you've had less they, they tend to be associated with kind of moist mild weather so it may be that we've had a slightly drier Period. early autumn when they kind of be most active that could be one reason having said which we, we did have reasonably mild um reasonably mild summer so yeah there's no massive rhyme or reason but it, it, you know the more we can reduce organic matter the more we can reduce kind of the leaf litter that the worms feed on again there's now no <clears throat> no insecticide to, to sort of control worm casts so um you know again it's kind of a mixture of cultural methods to to sort of try and um, either dilute the casts so that they're easier to disperse and that's where the top dressing comes in um, or doing practices to kind of reduce the uh, amount of sort of leaf litter and organic material they've got to feed on. Okay, thank you, Julian. Richard, do you want to, um, you've got your hand up, do you want to unmute yourself? Thanks, Ian. Um, just a quick question, earlier on, it was mentioned that um, if you're leasing or hiring the, the facility, it's sometimes a bit harder to get the funding. Is, is that a major problem? Because our local parish council 
um, basically leave the pitch maintenance to us in the winter um, between October and April time. Um, and then they sort of they do a real basic maintenance in the summer, which we enhance. Um, and it's the same with the, the sort of clubhouse facility. I know this is about the pitch, but um, would that be a, a serious problem for funding? I'll happily answer this one. I've seen that we've got a comment in the in the chat about it as well on a on a similar situation. So, from a pitch point of view, um, you don't need to necessarily have security of, of tenure. Um, you can obtain a pro forma license agreement from the parish council um, to be able to carry out additional works on the pitches. In essence, giving you approval or authority to carry out said works and the pro forma will detail what works you're intending on carrying out um, so therefore that means that you as a football club can be the applicant to the funding to the funding um, submission and funding request that's being made um, you just need to show that pro forma and license that you've got and them saying that yes we approve the football club to carry out x works also by doing that provides a little bit of clarity um, so there's no issues around you might be you, you might have a contractor who's coming in and carrying out X, Y and Z works for you. And there may be a contractor who's um, commissioned by the parish council to carry out um, an additional works. So there's a little bit it provides a little bit of clarity around responsibility and which party's responsibility for carrying out which works. So if there was substandard works carried out, at least there's no situation where you've got parties arguing over whose responsibility for the errors that have been made, so to speak. So you've got the ability to do that from a grass pitch point of view. If you're looking at improving um, improving changing rooms, that's a slightly different matter because it will come down to who ultimately owns you know, security of tenure on those respective um, pavilions, buildings, etc. So it might be, if it's a small grant, that the parish council will let you and really potentially be a joint applicant with you on a funding request. It might be that they need to be the lead applicants. There's other, there's other considerations as well. For example, VAT might be a consideration and football club might not be able to claim that back, but most parish councils can. So it's favourable to get them involved with, a, with an application. Yeah, lovely work. Thanks, Ian. We're just getting the um, agreement drawn up now. So that's, that's mm. good to hear. Yeah, Rich, Richard, drop me a line, drop me an email once you're in a position to talk and we can work through that. Okay, lovely, thank you. You're welcome. I think that might be all of the questions answered. So on that basis, um, I'm going to Thank everyone for their time that they've given up for this evening. Um, I've always think the information's great, but it's the questions and getting engagement from people who are who are on the WebEx that really um, provides the good the good learning and it was where the really good strong advice comes. So thanks for your attendance, thanks for your participation. Thanks to Matt and a big thank you to, to Julian for um, his input this evening. Um, it's great to be able to work with Julian and now introduce him to you and we look forward certainly from a Norfolk and Suffolk club point of view to working with Julian to improve a range of pitches that we have um, across our respective counties. What we'll do, I just need to wait for this recording to download from Zoom. It should be in by tomorrow, at which point what myself, I will share for the Norfolk clubs and Matt for his respective Suffolk clubs and we'll get that out to you as soon as we can. Um, and then if you have any questions that anyone's got, you can either fire them in to us. Um, we'll provide Julian's email address. So alternatively, you can you can consult with Julian if if, if need be. Um, Matt, have you got anything you want to add before we bring it to a close? No, just um, again, thanks for giving up your two hours. I've now figured out who Richard Neal is because I a bit of a scary moment when you think your CEO is on the call checking up on you. So. I knew you couldn't think that. A, diff a different Richard Neal on the calls. That always helps things when it's not the CEO checking up on you. So, no, cheers, everyone, and hope it's been helpful. Thanks, everyone. Julian, thank you. Um, have a good night, everyone. Yeah, thanks, sure. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks,